This is my friend, Mr. Jim Manon, and he is the father of Jamie Kelter and the grandfather of Claire Kelter, whom you met maybe about two, three weeks ago. Um, he is an engineer, and he's done a few other things, but he is just one of those people that you read about in The Millionaire Next Door who basically did everything right. Uh, just an ordinary person with an ordinary salary who has made piles and piles of money through saving, investing, having a loving family. And so all of these questions about those type of things are fair game. He can help you save money and stack it up right now. And uh, he has good career advice, good family advice, good Catholic advice, good marriage advice, good investment advice. He's just one of those people who is interested in money and just did a lot of really intriguing A-plus things with it. So, Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, I'm nobody special. I'm just a retired engineer, as Tim said. I've just been very, very fortunate. Uh, I guess when I was born, I was just hardwired to be very conservative fiscally. And I think that, that serves everyone really well if, if you can kind of adhere to some of the principles. Um, I retired two years ago. Let's start with the first slide. I'm in a position where I have, I mean, I'm not super wealthy, but I have plenty of money to do whatever I want. I can come here today. Um, tomorrow I'll be painting my basement. Um, the after that, I'll be playing golf. Um, went on a Rhine River cruise from uh, Switzerland to, to the Netherlands uh, this year. I also went to the, on a cruise through the Panama Canal. Um, so it's nice to be in a position where you can do whatever you want to do and that be feel constrained, and, and as, as I said, uh, a lot of it had to do with luck. I married a great, great, great wife, Kathy, um, and uh, maybe maybe God's had a hand in it too, because I don't know what I did deserve, but I've just been very, very fortunate. I have two great kids. I got a great, me, Sarah, a little, little granddaughter, Claire, who's a lot of fun. Um, own my own home, I don't have any debt, don't owe any money to anybody. And net worth-wise, I mean, I'll have more money than I'll, I'll need to spend. So you know, I just feel very, very fortunate. So, I met Tim through, I guess, my daughter and son-in-law. And I think Tim might share kind of an opinion. That's probably why you have this personal finance class, which I think is great, by the way. Because I think kids don't get, I didn't get anything, any information about personal finance in high school or college. I think kids can really benefit if, if they just listen and learn a little bit about money so they don't make big mistakes. Um, money can really help you or it can really hurt you. It kind of, it's one or the other. And uh, you're, you're, we all battle the best marketing, advertising people in the world. Every day there's people trying to figure out how to separate you from your dollar. Every day. I mean, it's a great detail. Advertising, um, you know, these iPhones and smartphones to the point of the targeting advertising. You walk into the Kohl's store, you walk out, you'll be getting a page or a text pretty soon that says 20% off the Kohl's because you didn't buy anything, they want you to come back in. I mean, that's how precise some of this advertising will be. And so, so I think it's only appropriate that you have some sense and some, some thought behind where you want to spend your money and how you want to spend your money because there's a lot of people trying to grab it from you. <coughs> Next slide. I guess I'm going a little too far here. I, I'm just here to kind of share my personal experiences with, with, with money and personal finance because it worked out really well for me. And, and, and I really believe in my heart, it's, it's a conscious decision whether you want to manage your money or you want your finances to manage your life. And, and believe me, the, the, the former is much, much better than, better than the uh, than, better than the latter. I, I don't argue that money buys happiness. All the studies say it doesn't. Um, um, so I'm not saying you need to be rich or save money for the sake of being rich. But I will argue that money in your, money in your pocket can give you choices in your life. And those choices can have a profound effect on your life and the life of everyone you care about. So, so money in itself doesn't make you happy, but it, it can make things happen for you that you may not have, have otherwise. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on. Who wants to be rich? 
I do. Who wants to be rich? Nothing wrong with being rich. In fact, and I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't have a Catholic high school education, so I don't. I'm not a biblical scholar. But there is a parable about the talents, right? You heard the parable about the talents, and and uh, so I take that to mean it's okay to, to do well for yourself. <laughs> just, there's nothing wrong with it. So who wants to be rich? I want to be rich. Um, why do you want to be rich? Why? Security? I, I like that answer. What else? <coughs> Anybody else? Um, um, if I don't have to worry about my own financial situation, then I can spend more time thinking about good things to do for family and friends. You know, it's just like when you're sick. If you've got the flu, it's hard to think about anybody else. So if you're broke, it's hard to think about anybody else. Yeah, it's, to me it's so you can do anything you want to do. You're not at the beck and call of, of a job or, or other, other constraints. So let's move on. Um, yeah, one more slide. Um, there's different definitions. Google says, being rich is having a great deal of money or assets or wealth. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it's really a subjective thing, definition, right? What rich means, everyone probably has their own, own perspective. Um, but for me, I think the next slide, it really is so, what we already touched on is being independent, doing what I want to do. In two weeks, a buddy of mine called, he's, got a, he's doing a favor for his accountant in St. Louis, has a business in St. Louis, and he, loves his accountant and she has him take a car down to Naples, Florida. And so his name is also named Jim. He called me and said, Jim, you want to go with me? I go, oh, yeah, I'll go with you. So I'll drive over to St. Louis. We'll drive 22 hours from St. Louis to Naples, Florida just to drop off a car. For what? Well, he's a, he's a really good friend of mine. I have the time, so why not? You know, so, so being independent, doing what you want to do, it's, it's a great feeling. Because for 36 years, plus four years of college, I was working pretty damn hard. And, and it's nice to just relax and, and not, not, not to worry about it. Um, not serving money is my master and no longer beholden my job. I don't have to worry about uh, that next phone call. Uh, I, I worked for AT&T for 36 years, originally Sowers and Bell, then SBC, then AT&T. And I finished in special services. And, and boy, that, that, that phone call comes, there could be all kinds of things wrong. <laughs> I mean, things go wrong in a hurry. And uh, you're up all night with service outages and stuff. I'm, I'm glad I'm done with that. So not being beholden to my job is wonderful. Uh, next slide. Um, again, each and every one of you can be just like me. It's, don't be like me personally, but be like me financially in that, in that you can be independent through, through just common sense and a series of decisions you're going to make through your life. And why not? Who, who wants to live paycheck to paycheck? And a lot of people do, by the way. A lot of people do. Um, or be, be in constant fear. I'll give you some examples. Um, next, next slide. slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, these are people I've known in my life. Um, uh, Donna. Here's a manager that reported to me in Dallas, Texas. Um, her husband worked for SBC. She was on the evening news in Dallas, Texas. It was a third generation telephone employee. And somehow she ended up working for me. And I noticed some irregularities on a, on a corporate credit card. And she tried to explain that her number got out and someone stole them. It kept happening. And it turned out she was using her corporate card to buffer her cash flow. She didn't have enough money to pay her bills that month. She would use her corporate credit card, which is a big no-no, and I had to fire because you just can't tolerate people people doing that, not in a large organization. Um, so she was just living on the edge, and if she didn't have enough money to cover her bills, she used her company company credit card to cover to cover her cash flow for that month, and you, you can't do it. And so I had to fire this guy. You know, she got kids, and who wants to live that way? Um, I had another engineer, another guy, Lon McLaughlin, uh, worked for me down in uh, Springfield, Missouri in engineering. And, and uh, 
he would always come to me and say, Jim, I need a raise. I need to make more money. And he worked for me. I know exactly what he made, which, which um, and, and he was living a lifestyle I didn't live. And I made more money than he did. And so I'd say, well, now you talk about three horses. Do those cost money? Oh, yeah, but those are my wife. My wife, we got to have the horses, blah, blah, blah. He said, you belong to this country club, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You have cable TV? Yeah. I said, well, I don't have a cable TV. I don't have cable TV. I don't have a membership to a golf country club. And I don't have three horses to take care of. I said, get rid of those things. I said, a lot of money, your salary is not your problem. It's, it's the spending side. And that could never, never register with him. And so he, he's just living, living on the edge like, like uh, the gal down, down, down in Dallas. Uh, this guy, Bernard, he's an external affairs manager in, in Eldon, Missouri. Um, and those guys used to be a liaison between the company and the public. And a lot of what they did was give away money, company money to good things and, and communities to keep goodwill between the company and, and our uh, uh, customers and communities. And, uh, he had like a $500 thing he was supposed to give away down in Eldon, Missouri, and somehow he never gave it away. And he moved it between three personal banking accounts. And there's this one old lady in this, in this club that she's supposed to get the money, and she kept asking about it, kept asking about it. Finally, she raised enough cane, and it all came out. He kept the money. So they had to fire him. You know, $500. A career. Good salary, good benefits. Threw it away over $500. Nuts. Uh, Sierra, she's a guy who cleans her house, um, and uh, nice guy. Um, but, but she's got two kids, and uh, she's got, uh, I don't think she's married, she's got a, a significant other. Um, you know, she was in her kitchen crying one day, and I said, what's the deal? And she bounced a couple of checks at Bank of America, and every time she bounced a check, there's like a $25 penalty, and she just says, beside herself because she didn't have that $25 to pay that penalty. But who wants to live like that? Nuts. And, and you don't have to. That's my message. I heard this statistic, or I read this statistic just last week. 78% of pro football players and 60% of pro basketball players are broke within five years. Broke meaning they owe more money than they have. And these are guys making multi-million dollars every year. Why are they broke in five years? You know? They just don't manage your money well. Choices, choices matter. Uh, next slide. Um, so I think we need to change our perspective about financial decisions. When you spend money, it's not just this point in time. That money really could have been invested and earned you more money in the future. So. So every decision is not static, it's dynamic. It continues through your life. And the bigger the transaction, the bigger the impact. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, there's an opportunity cost. When I spend money over here, the opportunity cost is what could I spend that money on that would have been a better choice. Um, in economics, you'll hear about that term, opportunity cost. Next slide. So I. Uh, I got an old 2004 Pontiac Bonneville, runs good, it's not worth much. Um, and I got three friends who are also retired have Corvettes. And they keep bugging me, when are you going to get your Corvette? And boy, they, you know, they, they changed the model year in 2014. It's a heck of a car. It's a great car. And it's really reasonably priced, really, for the low end one. It's priced very well. It's, I think, one of the best looking cars ever manufactured in my life. And, and I have the money to buy that. I can pay, I got that cash in the bank. I can go buy that today. So that's a decision I've been struggling with. Keep my old car or replace it with that. Um, so let's just say, let's just say, let's compare both choices. One choice keeping the car, one choice buying this car. Let's just see how that plays out over time. Next slide. So, so I got two columns here, the Bonneville and the Corvette. And let's say I have the six, 68,000, because it's going to be 63,000 plus sales tax, which is going to be another 5,000. So let's say I have this money right now. Um, and if I 
keep the bond bill, what I can do, I can invest that $68,000 in the stock market or in some investment. And if I get an annual return of 7%, in five years, that 68000 is worth $95,000. However, if I bought the Corvette, that $68,000 is now, the car is only worth $40,000. Let's play that out to 10 years. In 10 years, it's vested at 7%, that, that $68,000 would be worth $133,000. And if I bought the Corvette, it would maybe be worth $20,000 in 10 years. So my problem is that even though it would be a great car to have, um, would I rather have, what's my problem is, would I rather have $133,000 in 10 years or $20,000 in 10 years? That's, that's my problem. That's, that's, like I said, I'm hardwired to be conservative. And, and actually, I'd rather have the $133,000 in, in 10 years, you know, um, than, than drive, a, drive a really fancy, cool car. That's just me. Um, some people buy cars all the time. Um, but this is just a real life example. It's, it's, a, it's a dramatic one, I give you that. But, but when I say that financial decision impacts you over time, this is a big, that's a house, that's a small house, a really little house, you know, um, or $20,000. I mean, so, so I didn't buy the Corvette. I didn't buy the Corvette. Uh, next slide. But, but every transaction like that, if you go to, someone's got a calculator here, let's say you go to McDonald's and eat out, spend seven bucks at McDonald's, you know, and see what that Seven, that seven dollars is worth in ten years. All you gotta do is assume an interest rate. Let's say seven percent. Take one point oh seven, raise that to the tenth power, times seven bucks. That's probably about a th you know thirty dollars sandwich. I mean, it, that's, I mean, that's not the scale of a Corvette. But when I say every financial decision is life lasting, that's what I'm talking about. Here's another example. When, uh, when I worked for AT&T, right? So when iPhones came out, I didn't get one. And the reason I didn't get one is because I knew my wife would want one and both my kids. I had two teenage kids from high school or college. I think the iPhones came out in 2007. Uh, so if I got one for myself, I'd really have to get four. And at first, they were pretty expensive, too. Um, and so over, over five years, I didn't have one. I didn't have one for me, my wife, or my kids. And I got beat up all the time for my family because all of my kids' friends had them. All my wife's friends were trading pictures and stuff. But a couple years ago, right before Jamie got married, we went on a cruise, a Mediterranean cruise. A kind of a once-in-a-lifetime trip, right? We went to Rome for three days and then cruised the Mediterranean, stopped at all these ports of call. That's the uh, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Unbelievable church. We went to Mass there one night. Um, that's my family. I think that might be in Marseille, Marseille, uh, France. This is in Rome. Um, and that trip cost about fourteen thousand dollars for my family. So not having the way I look at not having these iPhones for five years, it paid for this trip. Now, if you ask my kids if they remember not sending that text or that picture, they could have five years ago, or do they remember going to the Colosseum? Or do they remember going uh, to St. Peter's Basilica? They'll remember those things. Okay. So it's choices. That's my point. Everything you do is a choice. And you can choose whichever way to, to manage your money or spend your money. But that's a, I think that's a great uh, illustration. Because I think it's kind of, you know, I'm glad people buy smartphones and use them because I, I like my AT&T benefits as a retiree. <laughs> I just didn't think value-wise it was good for, good for my family. Uh, so I put it off as long as I could. Finally, I put it off long enough my kids got to Rome, paid for it themselves. Yay, I didn't have to pay for it. And, uh, but I finally had to get one for my wife. So. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, so what I, this concept called the other side, to me it's always better to have people pay you than you pay them. I mean, it's a simple concept, right? But, Entrepreneurs and people in business, they found ways for people to pay them. But you can find little ways in your own, in your own life um, uh, 
you know, I purchased my first house in 1981. After I graduated college, I lived at home for two years, saved every nickel that was a down payment on my house. And then I had two guys from college live with me. They paid me rent. They paid, since they paid my house payment. Um, they're paying me to use my house. It was great because I liked them. We had fun, right, before I was married. Um, I have a great credit score. Um, so people who screw up their credit, they pay a lot higher interest or interest rates on their cards, which allows me to indirectly take advantage of the perks credit cards give me. I use credit cards, but I pay the bill. I've never, never financed them, uh, a dollar in my life for the credit card, but I take advantage of the perks because of that. Um, people with lousy credit pay more for insurance. I pay less for insurance because my credit's good. Um, um, and, then, and then I own a lot of stocks. Um, so, so and I own a lot of weird stocks. But, uh, so when people use ATM machines in, in Europe on a, on a network called uh, Your Net Worldwide, um, that helps my stock. It pays me money. Um, when people use smartphones or AT&T or AT&T product or services, great. They're paying me benefits. Um, people buy Conical Phelps gasoline, great. I get a dividend. I get a dividend here too at AT&T. Um, Procter & Gamble products, I get a dividend. People are paying me when they use those products. So, so this whole idea of, in fact, we're talking to Peyton, is that right? Earlier, before the, the session starts, she's come up with an idea, an entrepreneur idea. Um, those are great things to do. Um, my roommate in college, he started a sound business. Uh, he did uh, built his own amplifiers and speakers right in the dorm room. And they did, you know, this is before CDs, they had big LP records. They did sound uh, for all the fraternity parties out of Columbia. Um, I never got paid, but I got to go to a lot of parties. <laughs> No, it's just in college he's doing that, just, just for fun and actually making some money. So getting on the other side, have people pay you as, you, as opposed to you pay them. Always, a, well, it sounds simple, but this can work out pretty well if the idea holds up. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so this guy here, Mike, Mike was my roommate in college. Um, he started a business actually in Budapest, Hungary. And that business has grown and grown and grown and grown. So this is all of us going out to Las Vegas on his jet. Um, that's kind of an extreme side. His business uh, probably do about three billion revenue this year. Um, believe it or not, he this is his second business. His first business, he and Mark Mark Gallagher, um, they started a software business and they sold that to informants. And so he had all this money, all this time. He's in Budapest traveling. He sees all his people in line at the bank with paper pegs of money. Now this is right after the Berlin Wall came down. Okay, you're talking about the Cold War. Right when the Berlin Wall came down, Eastern Europe was a cash-only society. No written checks, no debit cards, no credit cards. When I say cash, cash. You go to work, you get paid in cash. Go to the bank, you put your cash in the bank. You go pay your bills, you go to the bank, get the cash out, go pay your bills. And it, it, the banks were state owned, so they're very efficient and very slow. So you stood in line at the bank and you thought, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> and so he, and so a lot of people didn't keep their money in the bank because it was such a pain. They kept it in the house and then people would steal the money in the house. So he got to talking to the banks. He started an ATM machine, a money, money uh, machine business um, in Budapest, and he did all through Europe now, and he's bought several other companies. And, uh, so that's a really good example of kind of getting on the other side. All because we talk about ideas finding you as opposed to you, and you just stumble into that. You know? uh, and Mark, he's been kind of an electronics guy. Um, you, know, you see the Christmas lights at Deanna Rose? He does all those. Uh, the lights on the Marriott downtown, he did those. He had a lighting business. If, if you go to Berlin, he did lights at the soccer stadium in Berlin, Germany. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's do that. Here's another example. I met this young lady, kind of hard to see. Her name is B. I forget her last name. Last Thursday. Does anybody know, this is kind of hard to see, who that is, who this guy is? Hard to see. 
I'll tell you his name. His name is Scott Kelly. Does that ring a bell? Scott Kelly is an astronaut, just spent a year on the International Space Station. He has a twin brother. Um, anyway, he came to Kansas City and spoke last Thursday. I went to see him. And it just so happened, my, my friend Mike's daughter's in school at Mizzou, and her good sorority friend is a gal named B, and she loves space, right? Loves space. So she found out that Scott Kelly was going to be at the Linden Hall Library uh, UMKC, so she drove up in Columbia. Turns out she started a jewelry business, and she makes these uh, bracelets, and they kind of wrap, they, they can wrap and unwrap, and there's like a, a little stone for every planet of the solar system. And uh, it takes <coughs> five minutes to make one, she's selling them for 30 bucks. So she drove up to, drove up to Kansas City, she got Scott wearing one in his presentation. <laughs> Um, just, just an idea she had, starting to go on up. I guess she's doing it from the shorty house. She's, she's got a website and a whole line of jewelry just, just, just on space stuff because she loves space. She's a marketing major. Um, kind of inter interesting guy. Gosh, well, you could do that after school today. So Scott Kelly, interesting guy. Um, he, he said that when he was in school, he was a below average student. He didn't do well in high school at all. He grew up in New Jersey. Um, and he finally decided one day to be a, a fiber pilot, but his grades weren't good enough. Um, and so he made a determined, uh, he, he kind of dedicated himself, to, I'm, I'm going to do that no matter what. And so his message to young people, there's three messages. One is dream big. One is don't be afraid to take risks. And the third is set goals, set manageable goals. If you want to get here and you're here, you set all these intermediate goals and you work on one goal at a time. You don't worry about the big picture. You accomplish that goal. Then you accomplish this goal and accomplish this goal and accomplish this goal. So he became a Navy fighter pilot flying the, uh, uh, the same plane they use in the Top Gun movie. The two seat, two seater, and then he ended up applying for the astronaut corps only because his, his buddy did, and he was accepted and became an astronaut. Flew three space shuttle missions, and then he was in space for a year, a full year. Um, he was, he was a boy for a year, one year, like on the international station. space station for a full year. And his his brother, twin brother, is an astronaut too. So what they did, they compared his life, his his uh, health. The effects of being in space for a year on him compared to his twin brother, because genetically they're identical, so they want to. The interesting thing was he started off uh, being being older than his twin brother, but when he came down, he's younger than his twin brother. Why is that? He was born six months older than his twin brother, but now his twin brother's older. Six minutes. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Six minutes. Six minutes. <laughs> why is that? A little bit off topic here. But why is that? It has something to do with what? Gravity affects like how how fast time moves. Uh, you got one word right. Time. It goes back to Einstein's theory of relativity. The faster you go, time slows down. And they've proven that with, you know, when they, when, they went to, when they went to the moon, they put a, a cesium clock on the, 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 lunar, on the, the, the capsule, and they had one on Earth, and they had them synced up perfectly. And sure enough, when they compared clocks, when it got back, it was a little bit less. It, Einstein's theory So time slows down, his health slows down. So he's actually younger now than his brother. But anyway. Okay, next slide. Oh, you can, oh, you can look at that. Ask. This is uh, her website, by the way, if you want to look at it. She set up a neat website you can pay online, and she'll mail it to her. Her biggest problem now is making them fast enough because they're getting a lot of notoriety. Okay, next slide. Um, so getting on the other side, whether it be starting a business or finding innovative ways for people to pay you, it's great. You, you, you get on this track, you'll never have to worry about money. 
Um, but it takes work, it takes time, um, it doesn't happen by itself, um, it takes patience and a long-term view. Um, but often the, the, the benefits are just reoccurring for forever. Okay, next slide. Okay, miracle compounding. Um, I talked about the car and investing that $63,000 or $68,000 over time, right? Um, you know, if you save 100 bucks and invest and say the rate of return is 7%, and you put 100 bucks a month into your account every month for a long time, many years, this compounding, you know, that $100 after a year is worth $107. So $107 goes in and it's reinvested, reinvested, reinvested. And so it just grows. So, so over 40 years, that $100 a month all of a sudden becomes um, $512,000. Just $100 a month over 40 years becomes $512,000. Um, this works. This is what's helped me a lot. Um, it takes a long time, but it takes discipline. But, but this really does work. Um, next slide. So if you look at a graphical representation <coughs> of numbers, you start out very small, and it stays small for a long time, but finally it starts growing big time. And this is fun out here. This is nice. Okay. But there's no shortcuts. To get to here, you got to start. you got to start. I knew people at Sowers and Bell that we had a 401k program. You put in a buck, they put in 80 cents up to your 6% of your salary. And I knew people that said, I can't afford to put money in the 401k. You can't afford not to. They pay you 80% return immediately when it goes in. Um, you got to start. You got to start. You can't put it off and put it off and put it off. Now, I'm not suggesting high school students start putting money, although it would be great if you start investing in stocks, just for an educational spend. But when you, when you get out of school and you start your life, professional lives, Start saving, investing, living below your means, investing. You gotta start. You can't get to here unless you do this. There's no shortcuts. Unless you just inherit money and marry somebody really wealthy, I guess. But, but if you did it on your own, you gotta start. That's $100 a month. What's $400 a month look like? Next slide. If that was meat, this is filet, okay? So now we're talking a million dollars in 40 years, $400 a month. Miracle compounding, it really works. Yeah, yeah, I'm that's assuming some percent. Yeah, some years will be seven. bigger, some years will be smaller. But that's not unreasonable over a broad period of time of 40 years. What was the last one? It was only $30 a month. Yeah. Uh, 512000 That's about there. This really works. This is this is what's made me to where I can do whatever I want just so I can go drive to Naples with anybody. And a Volkswagen bug. And I'm six foot two. Okay, next slide. I'm sorry, I'm getting a technical difficulty. Uh, Apple TV is our software. Either that or it's me. We're good? Okay. What do marshmallows, Corvettes, and jet planes have in common? Jet propulsion. Uh, kind of a strange group of things, right? Well, it turns out sociologists have done a lot of studies. And one of the classic studies, and you can Google this and look it up online. There we go. Sorry. I got lost for a second. That's all right. I apologize. That's all right. Go, go ahead. Next slide. It's a classical study they've done. They've repeated it. It holds up. Um, you take a group of kindergartners, and you sit them down at a table and you tell them, okay, I got a plate of marshmallows here. You can all have one right now if you want. But if you wait 15 minutes, I'll give you two of them. So some will take the marshmallow right now, some will wait the 15 minutes. Okay? Then they record who chose what. And they track those kids through their lives. Guess what? kid that says, I'll wait the 15 minutes for two, those kids generally do better and get higher levels of education, higher levels of professional success, 
and there's higher levels of network. This is why it's called delay gratification. That's what that's what personal finance really is. You know, living below your means, invest in the difference for tomorrow, put it off for tomorrow, as opposed to consuming everything today. That was Donna's problem. She consumed everything today. That was Lon's problem, consuming everything today. But but if you can live below your means and take the difference and invest it and let that compounding, miracle compounding work for you, then you're in control of your own lives financially. You really are. And, I, and I'm just somebody that, that that plan worked for me really well. I don't know of anyone that hasn't worked well. Those pro football players and basketball players, they spent their money. They're out of money. At least two-thirds of them spent all their money. But they would have saved half of it. You know Jay Leno, of course you're a little younger, but Jay Leno Tonight Show, mm -hmm. they say that he's got had two sources of income. One was his stand-up comedy. He still does stand-up comedy through, goes on tour all the time. And the other one was hosting The Tonight Show. Okay? He never spent any of the money hosting The Tonight Show. That was all his extra money. He just invested that. He lives on his stand-up comedy money. And he's worth tons of money. I mean, I mean that's his mindset. Um, so, so delay gratification, living below your means, investing the difference, that miracle compounding, that, that, that set me up really nice. Um, now if you gotta have it now, and spend it all now, that's your choice, that's your choice. Um, but if you're able to delay that gratification, you're gonna be much better off. Next slide. Uh, avoid financial pitfall. When you pay someone interest, you're, paying, you're making someone else rich. You're not making yourself rich. If you can't afford to buy something with cash, how can you afford to buy it with cash plus interest that you're paying somebody else? So, so anytime you pay interest, I think that's bad. You're, you're making some other guy rich. If you can't afford it, you certainly can't afford to buy it and finance it too. One exception, a home. No one could just buy a home for cash. So. So if you ever decide to have a home, and I encourage you to do so, sure, you're going to get a loan, you're going to pay interest on that loan. But be smart about it. You, don't, you know, a lot of people, if you look at the numbers, a 15-year loan, you'll pay a lot less interest than a 30-year loan. Um, I've never paid credit card interest, ever. That's paying someone else money, making them rich. I've uh, never paid interest, uh, never borrowed money to buy a car. If you can't afford a car, don't buy it. Buy, there's lots of cars. You could buy a $1,000 car. Yeah, you're going to have some repairs. But, 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 but buying an expensive car right out of college, that money you don't have and financing it, not good. Not good. Um, college. College costs keep going up. You probably talk about this a lot more than me. Uh, um, I'm glad my kids are out of school. <laughs> um, you may have to borrow some money to go to college, but if you do, be smart about it. You'll find financial aid offices at colleges, they want you to borrow money. Because guess what? You're going to be paying it to the school. It helps the school. I think that's one reason <coughs> college educations have gone up so high is that kids can borrow money, any amount of money they want, and go to any college they want. And so colleges just keep raising their prices. and they. Uh, my nephew got a master's down at University of Texas at Austin, and, and his name is Garrett. Great kid. Gave me a tour of the campus. I, I saw this climbing wall in the recreation center. You know, climbing wall with harnesses and all these little stones on the wall. I said, Garrett, help me understand. How did that help you learn engineering? Aerospace engineering, that was his major. How did that climbing wall facilitate your learning experience? But that's what these school campuses do. They just keep adding more and more facilities because kids will borrow money and pay. So when you when you go to school, if you gotta borrow money, that's that's all right. Be smart. Don't don't borrow money for a degree plan. It's not gonna give you a job, a good job, a decent job. If you wanna study European poetry, fine. Just don't borrow money to study European poetry, okay? Um, if your parents have the money, fine. If your grandparents have the money, fine. If you want to study something frivolous. 
But if you don't have the money, don't borrow money to buy, or don't borrow money to uh, take, a, take a, a major that you can't get a job for. Um, marriage. Um, that's a, if you get divorced, that's a killer financially. Both sides, it's just a killer. Just a killer. Um, so my only point, my only point here is, someday you'll you may decide to get married, and if you do, you choose your spouse. That's right. You choose who you marry. You choose who you marry. It's a choice. And I'm telling you, all the sociologists say you better be on the same page when it comes to religion, money, on how fiscally you look at money. Um, if you're going to have children, how you're going to raise the children, and sex. Um, those four things, you better be on the same page or your marriage is going to have a tough time for a long time. If you get divorced financially, no one comes out except the lawyers. The lawyers do well. Right? And realtors. Realtors, 40, half of all home sales are because of divorces. Realtors come out on that too. Okay, next slide. Uh, I touched on this already. Um, choosing a college and degree program. Um, the world is becoming a technical place. Science and math rule. Now, I'm an engineer, so I'm biased. I admit I'm biased. But I will say, when I talked to Scott Kelly last Thursday night, he made this remark. He said, the DOD, Department of Transportation, did a study that said the two greatest threats to the United States, number one is terrorism, Number two is not enough scientists and engineers. If you decide to go into a technical field, you will find a job. You really will. And it'll probably be a good paying job. No longer, in my opinion, can someone stumble out of high school with a C average, get a good union job that's going to pay them benefits and enough to raise a family. That, that's gone. That's over. A lot of that manufacturing is gone. Sure, there's still manufacturing and there's still some union jobs, but, but as a percentage of where they were in the 1960s, the majority of them are gone. Um, so when you choose your degree plan and choose your college, think about it really hard. It's probably the big, one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make. It's not an easy decision, I give you that. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> I just turned 60, so I still want to figure out what I want to do. But um, but choosing an expensive school for an undergrad, I call that dumb. And then choosing a worthless degree program at an expensive school, that's dumb. That's dumb and dumber. You've probably seen a movie, Dumb and Dumber. That's my dumb and dumber. Um, when you decide what school you're going to go to and what your major is going to be, you need to really put a pencil to the cost and benefit of that. You know, there's lawyers coming out of law school now that can't get work. There's more, there's not enough jobs for lawyers. And that's a, three-year graduate program on top of a bachelor, bachelor degree, four-year degree. And law school's not cheap. Um, so think about this real hard. Um, there's a lot of ways to pay for school other than just borrowing tons of money. Um, you know, you probably already know this, but grants are free. Free. No strings attached. No loans, no payback. They're free. And there are a lot of grants out there. Now, you may apply to 10 and you only get one or two, but that's okay. It'll be the best use of your time. You can make more money applying to grants than you can't work in anywhere else. Apply to 50 and get five. Why not? It takes time, but grants are free money. Uh, there's nothing wrong with working through school. My wife uh, was the oldest of eight kids. Her dad, uh, my father-in-law had cancer at an early age. She had to go her own way through school, no help at all. But she was an RA, resident assistant at the University of Missouri. Um, so she kind of worked her way through school, uh, plus summer jobs. Um, and believe it or not, people who actually work through college, they've done studies, actually do better in college than people who just go to college. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because people who work and go to college, they have much less time and people just go to school and have fun. Yes? Well, just from my point of view, having done that, but also having taught a lot of college, your emotional investment in college is a lot higher if you are paying for it yourself. If you can correlate, oh, I'm working in this 
math lab or writing lab or during the summer, oh, hey, I'm doing construction, you know, I did all these things. Then your emotional investment in that class that you take is a lot higher. So, yeah, that just, that helps me make good, good grades. Nothing wrong with junior college for a couple of years, nothing wrong living at home for a couple of years if you can't afford to be away. Last choice should be borrowing money to go to school. And if you do, it should be the minimal amount you can get away with. By the way, school loans, you can never, you can never declare bankruptcy and get rid of them. They're tied to you forever. The way laws are today. In graduate school, if you're really good, Graduate schools will pay you to be a grad student and teach. Okay, those are pitfalls. What else we got? Next slide. Um, choose your career carefully. All these guys, all my buddies, there's me over there. Uh, Tom, he's a professor at the Northwestern, teaches chemistry. He's got a whole building that does his own research. The only reason he's working because he loves his research. He has research on zinc, heavy metals in the body. Mike already talked about him. Uh, you know, he's a CEO of Unit Worldwide. Um, Mark has just been out there. Um, they, these guys actually started a software business called Innovative Software. Before there's Microsoft Office, you know, with Excel, Word, and Access, before that existed, uh, they wrote a, uh, a program called Smartware and, and were very successful with it and sold it to informants and they became, they went public and became financially independent then. Sean's retired, he's an accountant. Um, uh, and that's my younger brother. He flies for, well, it was Continental Airlines, not United. He still works, but he just loves flying. He just loves flying. Um, Mike, he's still working. He'll work till he's dropped in. He's, he, he just, uh, he's not a technical guy. <laughs> he works for nonprofits, and that's all well and good, but. Um, he'll be working for a long time. But all the, everybody else there is in pretty much, Steve, I don't know what he did. I don't know him very well. But everyone else here is in a technical field and did very well. That's my message to you. When you choose your career, math and science, it's hard to go wrong. Um, and the world's becoming more and more technical every day, every day. You're going to see some neat things um, in the next, next 50 years, some really cool things. Um, next slide. Uh, other financial pitfalls, like I said, you know, a lot of people, they go to college, they get a job. First thing they do is buy a brand new car. I say don't do that. Buy one that's two, three years old. It's already had a lot of depreciation out of it. Um, you know, um, Relying on two salaries if you get married and have a family. Relying on two salaries if you decide you need a lifestyle that takes two salaries. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard if one loses their job or something goes wrong. Something's going to, you know, some bills aren't going to get paid. Um, although it's pretty common not to have two incomes in a family. Living at or beyond your means, well, I talked a little bit about that. Um, I'm saying live below your means, invest the difference, let that miracle compounding work. If you're below your means, um, when something goes wrong, you can deal with it. One problem doesn't cause the other problem. Um, if, you, if you don't live below your means, you can't invest and save, you can't take advantage of that miracle compounding. Um, also, if you're at your means, there's no room for tithing and charitable contributions. Now, I, I don't like spending money. I really don't like giving money away. Um, we moved here, Kansas City from Springfield, Missouri. I got transferred. I started in St. Louis, went to Springfield, came here, joined St. Teresa Parish. And about the first, I grew up Lutheran, by the way. My wife's Catholic. I grew up as a Lutheran. Um, and one of the first masses we went to St. Teresa, uh, Person gave a talk on giving, you know, and he was in his own realtor business, and, and it was very kind of inspirational. And, and he said, there are times they didn't think they could afford to give, but they did anyway, and it really worked out for them. For me, it's really crazy. I hate giving money away, but every time I do, 
it seems like financially I end up in a better position. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's divine intervention or not or just pure luck, but every time we seem to give more money away, things work out better. You know, we were at uh, uh, Saturday night, they had the big uh, deal about the hotel, uh, Catholic Charities, and uh, gave a bunch of money away there. Didn't, my wife's kind of twisting my arm, you know, because she's more, a little more devout than I am. But wrote them a big check, and today my stocks are doing great. I'm in the market, so it's hard to explain. But if, if you don't live below your means, you can't do tithing and charitable contribution. And as a Christian, I think that's a that's a strong strong tenet in your life, right? Um, if you live it above your means, you can't. You, sometimes you have to rely on consumer debt, credit cards to pay your bills, and they're charging 12, 18 percent interest. They're, right now, when interest rates in a bank are less than a percent, that's like that's like armed robbery. But there's people that do that. And then in the worst case, if you just want to shoot yourself in the head, all these payday loans you see everywhere, that's where people go and get an advance on their paycheck. They're charging them 40% you know, interest, 40, 50, 60% interest. They're just, and those are people who can least afford it. So, so if you're living right at right your means, when things go wrong, you get forced into this stuff, that hurts you even more. So. Okay, next slide. Um, so these are my keys to being rich. Recognizing every financial decision lasts a lifetime. Remember my car example? You know, I'd rather have the $110,000 10 years from now than the $68,000. Um, miracle of compounding, I can attest that works. Um, trying to get on the air side, find innovative ways that people pay you instead of you paying them. Choose your career and education very carefully. Marriage is for life. Um, this whole delay gratification thing, this is the key. About living below your means, saving for tomorrow. If you can do that, big, big difference in your life. And avoiding other pitfalls. I think that's the last slide, isn't it? So anyway, that's just by my experience. So. Wait, is this? Oh, OK. All right, yeah, OK. So so you can choose to manage your finances, or your finances will probably manage you. It's kind of kind of that way. We're, you want to be in a driver's seat, but you want you want to be like my like clean lady Sierra and, and have to, I got a sister-in-law just like that, or everything manages her. Um, if you, if you follow some of this advice, you can be in the position I am when you're 58 years old. When I originally wrote this slide, it was two years ago. I'm 60 now. I, I can wake up every day and do what I want. The neat thing you all have is your youth, okay? Your age, you're young. Time is on your side. That miracle compound, and you can get that started whenever you, whenever you can. Um, time is on your side. When someone's 50 years old, and decide, well, I'd like to retire, and they're stuck. They can't. They, they lost 30 years. You can't make that up. You need, that, you need those early years to, to, to get to the meat, to the filet. Um, um, appreciate what you have. Um, a lot of people have a lot less. And then the last thing, this is what my dad used to say, money is something really good to have when you really need it. I think that's it. Hopefully that's the last slide. Should we do a stretch break and then Q&A? Okay. Hey, why don't you guys uh, do a little stretch break and then let's uh, do a Q&A. I asked you guys last week to write down items from your own budget and maybe Mr. Uh -huh. Manown can make suggestions for either cheaper or more fun.